Hey, welcome to Repair University Live. It is Tuesday. It is November. And it's, it's raining. And it's cold. <laughs> It's warmer in New York than it is down in the south. That's hey, let's uh, let's scratch the fundraiser for AC right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah we don't need that. <laughs> but I do need heaters. Yeah. So new fundraiser yeah. so we can have heat out here. It's just not something we have to deal with in Arkansas. So, yeah. I think on the car this morning there might have been a little bit of snow. A little just bit? Just a couple little, you know, things. Yeah. Well, we wanted Larry to feel at home. Yeah, the whole well, time would shut down. Well, yeah. you know, it... it and it's 60 I jumped and in the raining in New York. I jumped in the car with him this morning and he had nothing but complaints. He's checking New York going, <laughs> it's 55 in New York. And well, <laughs> it could have been perfect weather and he would still have nothing but complaints true, when he picked true. him up in the morning. It's so 400 degrees here or cold. Mm, it's never true. nice here. It's always nice here. No, it's not. It's the south. He's not moving here anytime soon. You name it, said. we can fry it. Oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> totally is. Totally moving. All right, so let's get started on yep. uh, today's topic. So we're going to talk about SOPs. Um, now, the reason we decided to make this a topic. Stupid, obnoxious people? No. Oh. Sopping biscuits. Oh, SOP sopping. Sopping. biscuits. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to talk SOPs. So here's the reason we're doing this, is that as we travel the country, um, the three of us individually, sometimes we're together, we're working with shops, um, and when we go in and sit down with them and we ask them what your processes are for things, we get this glassy-eyed deer in the headlights look. If you happen to have a process, it's normally not even yours. It's something that you came from a vendor. Let's say it's a, um, a, a sanding process, a yep. filler, or your paint company gave you something for mixing and applying. But you're not developing your own SOPs, and therefore you're not being profitable. And, yeah, you're not and, and really what we see is, is that they say we have an SOP. Yeah. Like how do you check a car in or you know whatever that is? And then they go, well, this is how we do it. But then if I ask somebody else, they don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. And this other person doesn't do it that way, but we do have this one piece of paper that we only fill out half of the form, half of the things that are in there, and everybody says they have an SOP. Or you ask them for their SOPs, and they go, "Oh, let me find them." They dig it in their computer in their drawers, so they're not posted. Nobody knows what they are, but they have SOPs. Right. Uh, everybody says Which they got them. they don't have one. But they don't. Um, that, there's a reason. It's kind of like police interrogation. We separate everybody and put them in different rooms <laughs> when, we, <laughs> when we get to a place, because that's how we're really going to find out what's and going on. And they all on. lie. So. Let's just start with the basics, right? Mm -hmm. Mark, what is an SOP? Well, it's just a standard operating procedure. It's just how we are going to do business. And every company is going to be a little bit different. But, you know, think about it like from a police officer standpoint. When you get pulled over and they decide that you have a gun or something, they start to read you your rights. And that's an SOP. Well, the first thing they walk over, you know why I pulled you over? It's like I didn't know how to do a multiple choice test or an essay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you, 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 what? I was speeding? Uh, well, yeah, you, yeah. you know, you were doing 60. Yeah, well, I only had 70, but you stopped me. You yeah. know, I thought we were in a race. I mean, you know, what do you want from me? So, so when, you know, when you move from one department to another, an SOP is where you leave off from that. So after you have been arrested and you're taken to the police station, everybody in that police station knows what point you left off That's at because over. they followed a standard operating procedure. I mean, driving. That's an SOP. Right. You know, you turn, you turn on your turn signal when you turn lanes. I mean, it's a rule, but it's also an SOP of how you drive. So pretty much every aspect of every business has SOPs, whether they're written or not. And a lot of times the SOP is in somebody's mind. And there's also a dis difference between the instructions and an SOP. Like the instructions yeah. are, we do this, this, and this for mixing body filler, for example. Right. And I think what a lot of shops think are SOPs really are product instruction sheets from manufacturers. Yep which is not yeah. an SOP. Yeah, and the bottom line is is that if we do it, if, you know, when you follow an SOP, it's done the same way by everybody every time. Huh. So when you go to, you know, the king of SOPs that most people come in contact with is McDonald's. I mean, whether you like the food or not, it's the same no matter whether you're in China, you're in, well, not necessarily China, but uh, <laughs> Japan, New York, Seattle, it doesn't matter, it's the same. Right. That's an SOP. Right, and SOPs when done correctly, not only if I don't know how I do something, mm -hmm. then I don't know how to charge for that thing. Right. So SOPs keep me profitable, but SOPs also keep me legally protected. Absolutely. Because if I'm doing the same thing all the time, it makes it real easy for me to attest in when I'm you know, being badgered <laughs> in a deposition or on the well, stand well, for well, what you, I did every time that for every car. Well, you've been in enough depositions as I have, as we all have. Basically, especially when you're with the uh, insurance companies, they would say, give us your SOP for that. How did yep. you guys do that? I mean, right. that's the first thing they subpoena. Right. And I'll ask you the same thing about 27 different times. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if you're doing it the same way all the time, then you're not going to have any problem with right. that. But if exactly. you don't, 
um, you're going to fall apart. So yep. where do SOPs come from? <laughs> Wherever. So SOP companies, there are companies out there that actually will come in and develop SOPs for you. Yeah, those are super effective. Well, <laughs> 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 and, then, and, then, and then nobody will follow them, but right. um, you'll have an SOP. Yeah. But And paint companies, if you talk to your paint supplier, they got tons of SOPs on how to do all these different things and their management different things. Consultants, or clown sultans as you like to call them. Well, most of them are clowns, yeah. <laughs> they, they really they uh, lie. They, you know, they trade organizations. Steal. Trade organizations, you get together with your friends, hey, how do you guys do this? And you talk about how to do processes. It can be internal stuff, or the best way that we found is, have your employees do them. Mm -hmm. Talk to your CSR at the front desk saying, how do we intake a car? Write it all down. And everybody looks at it, and we'll talk more about how to build one later, but you can get them from multiple different places. It's, it's really great to steal them from others than to modify them for your shop. Though. The best way that I've found is, is have them write down what they normally need to do, then you know, I will go over it and tell you, okay, this is what I've seen work in other shops, mm -hmm. this is what I've not seen, so we'll, we'll take and critique their 10 items and maybe make them 14. Mm -hmm. And it seems to work better for them because they came up with it, they're adapting to it, it's easier, but it's just a matter of everyone's gonna follow. So if the CSR is out that day and I have to have one of my estimators do it, he's not running around trying to figure out, well, what I'm do I gotta do? Yep. Just like um, if my estimator isn't in who fills out the paperwork, the CSR can start the paperwork and fill it out because, well, I know what paperwork has to be in the folder and I know what has to be signed and how to explain yeah. it versus, I don't know, I don't sign people up, leave the call, we'll get to you tomorrow. Yeah, now I love it when you pay me to come in and do your SOPs mm -hmm. for you because that's, that's money that I'm, get, I'm gonna make just to Absolutely. hang out in a body shop for a week, which is kind of fun, right? So it's almost like some people like to go to the beach, I'd rather go to the body shop and hang out. Yep. I know it's weird, but, but so I love that. But at the end of the day, you don't need anyone to really help you do SOPs. No. You can do them on your own. They are time consuming. You do have to devote. You're not gonna sit down and do all your SOPs in a week. Nope, You're gonna nope. have to do one at a time. The only time I tell a shop that it's sometimes valuable to have somebody else come in is if you have an over empowering, um, an overpowering, employee and you don't have a strong position as the owner so if if you have somebody that tends what, to the old tail wags the dog bit yeah that was a, we'll blame the painter right or you have that 30 year old body tech and and if you need somebody to come in and kind of i don't, I don't want to say put them in their place but, but if you need listen, they'll if, listen to somebody that's not the boss right they just will right yeah. so if you have that type of situation if not then that's why they put wheels on toolboxes Right, and we help you push them to the curb. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, it was, so. you know, and so one of the things that I, that I just wanted to bring up is last night we were in a restaurant and we were having dinner and, and next thing we know, one of the, the people in the, in the restaurant, they're wiping the table down and normal stuff and then they open up this thing and they start wiping down the light. And so we asked the waitress, we said, you know, what's the deal? What's your SOP for this? She goes, oh, well, here's what we got to do. Got to wipe the table, we got to wipe the ketchup bottles, got to clean the menus, we got to wipe here, wipe there. I said, is that fill the, written? Fill the, uh, the, the condiments. Yeah, put the, and she had a whole list of things that was to her memory. And I said, have you ever seen that written down anywhere? She goes, no, that's how I was trained. I can promise you in that restaurant, it's written down by somebody because everybody did it that way. Yeah. Right, which goes back to the differences in instructions and SOPs and you can have them. And if you teach them all the right way and everybody's learning the right way and yep. everybody knows the process, well then it just becomes kind of old hat, just, second it's nature. the way it's done. In a way. Yep. So um, one of the things that I find <laughs> that's, that's frustrating when I visit shops is that they tend to think that they need o SOPs for big rocks, right? <laughs> yeah. Like big rock situations in the shop. but. What are some typical things that need an SOP for your average collision repair center? I'll be honest, I mean, uh, opening the shop up in the morning. Um, most shops have an on-demand meter, and if you throw on everything at one time, you spike the system, you can change your average you know, usage, and now your bill is higher than what it should be. So some shops have um, procedures where you go around and you turn on either banks of lights, or they have those lights that turn on very slowly and get brighter as it goes on and then once the lights are fully on I'm allowed to turn the spray booth on and then once that's on I can I'm allowed to turn on the compressor mm -hmm. you know and then I'm allowed to turn on the paint mixing machine so there's a process to it I get in early before everybody else so no one's turning the flipping switches on I turn it on in, in portions you can shut everything off at once but portions uh, maybe a closing procedure okay make sure the two back doors are locked make sure the um, alarm system is on and that you know this the, mm -hmm. this code is put in um, once you do that, make sure the outside door is locked or make sure the uh, key drop box is good. Make sure there's no cars parked out on the front apron or the front parking area. You know, you're, you're going to have these stupid little procedures for that. It could even be uh, um, an SOP on a cabinet door for supplies. 
I'm down to uh, my last uh, uh, full box of, let's say, post-its, and I have a stack here. If I grab these, and once you get down to just one, and Mark grabs this, there's another whole box that'll last me a few weeks. But now I'm told I have to order another three boxes, because right. I always have to have three boxes backing it up. Yep. Or it's sandpaper, same type of thing. Once you get so down basically, to basically, is it fair to say that there's really a need for an SOP for just about everything Pretty in much the shop? Everything. Pretty much everything well, in your shop to keep it running the right way, so somebody if, knows what somebody's doing in case somebody's not there. Well, but how often do we walk in the shops and just tell the truth about this? We it's walk in and say, this is how we do it. But then we ask somebody else, how do you do it? And they don't say that's how they do it. So everybody's got their own little SOPs of how they think it should be done. And there's just not any consistency. Right. You know, it's, it, it's, it's like you don't go to McDonald's and McDonald's says, oh, well, we don't have Big Macs. Why not? Well, we ran out of two old beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pay. No, you don't get that. You get, they always have it in stock because McDonald's comes in with an SOP that when I walk into the store from corporate and I go around and I know how much stuff you use, I just order it and you pay the bill. There is no argument with that. Just like, you know, you go to a shop, you shouldn't run out of body filler, you shouldn't run out of sand, pa you know, uh, 50 it, grit sandpaper. It paper. cracks me up in that chicken place we went to. Oh, uh, yes. They ran out of chicken. They ran out of chicken. <laughs> we don't have wings. <laughs> what do you mean we don't have wings? Well, it's like going to Steve's Steakhouse and Steve, hey, Steve, I want a steak. Oh, we're out of steak. Well, I came to the steakhouse. I don't want chicken. I came to the steakhouse. I want a chicken. It's like going to KFC and KFC, oh, we'll get no chicken. What else do you serve? Yeah. yeah. But I think we put SOPs around um, what we think is a customer checklist, mm -hmm. right? Or, or an SOP for how a car is, goes into the paint booth. But we forget that the real things that make us money are the 90 other things in the shop that we're not paying attention to. A checklist to. helps you do your job during your SOP. The SOP tells you what, what procedures you have to go over, and then a checklist is for a specific operation on that car. So it's not an SOP. So the yeah. SOP is telling you, these are the things you have to do for every car that comes into this shop. So a customer checklist is on the SOP. Mm -hmm. And then you go down the ch customer yep. checklist to make sure everything's, you know, properly done That's on the That's an car. SOP for the intake. And, and right. Think about it. Pretty much every car that comes in the shop, you get it in the back, you tear it down a little bit, and you find maybe some more damage, right? Or in the blueprinting stage or whatever. When that happens, every shop's going to handle it different. Maybe you go talk to the estimator, you talk to... But what's the SOP? How do we do it in right. our shop consistently every for time? For every car, yep. every time. All Look, every. SOPs make me money. Yeah, Plain and right, simple, absolutely. they're like they're you know they're like green printing money in a way. And yep. if you have them, you make money. If you don't have them, if if you make money, it's by happenstance. If you're losing money, start there. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes so. just a list of common sense stuff that you might forget about and that you want everyone to understand. Like there should be never a reason that somebody paints a car then masks it off. They already know I got to mask it off before I paint it. You know, I mean, there's certain common sense <laughs> things you go, well, once again, you know, you gotta, you gotta realize that, that it's kind of like if you, you have to go to the bathroom, you first, you know, have to lift up the toilet bowl seat, you have to go ahead and then, you know, open your pants. You do not, if you don't open your pants, you're gonna have a really serious problem leaving the bathroom. That's I mean, where you wanted to go with this. Yeah, That's exactly. And you know, as funny, as stupid as it humor. sounds, it's common sense, <laughs> you know, uh, but people sometimes don't realize that. So you need an SOP for that. But if I wrote it. I don't need a GoFundMe for heat. Right. I now need one for more legal bills. Yes, I oh, got legal that. Bills I got that. All right. But how many, yeah. seriously, how many times you walk into a bed and they got those cute little signs there no, ever. that always tell no. you something stupid? No. You know what I mean? And you so. read them, you go, you laugh. Or it says, wash your hands before you turn it Right, or wash your hands, which you should know already. How many times have we seen that? An SOP by the state or, or the city for employees must wash hands when you leave. Shouldn't you just do that? Didn't your mom teach you as a kid? I mean, you know. But how hands? many times do you see that, you, you know, especially when you're going through airports? These guys, they're, they're going and they just walk out the door, don't wash their hands. It's like, wow, I want to make sure I don't touch well, anything you Well, once you, you travel, touched. you realize how dirty, <laughs> how dirty it is to try to fly to the airplane. Anyways, let's get off the bathroom okay. humor. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't reading my face already, yeah. we need an SOP for how to read Kristen's face. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's the next one we're going to do. have that in writing. We're just Apparently, I left it. that one out. Now we know we have a need. But you no, know, you, we do. We okay. try and point out obvious things to people, and this is why SOPs are needed. They're for the obvious stuff that you think is funny or you don't clearly, realize. Clearly, and what happens work. is... <laughs> They don't follow it in the shop because if I'm not there and Mark's got to cover my position, mm -hmm. it should be, now Mark's going to maybe talk to the customer slightly differently, but the paperwork slightly. and the stuff he has to just, do. Just slightly <laughs> differently. Reminds me of when you were in Texas, the guy said what he said and he's like, did you talk to Larry? Oh, no, uh, 
You didn't talk to Mark. No, Mark didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I got the blame for it. Yeah. Um, all um, right, so why don't people follow SOPs? It, if, you know, if they're out there and, and there's people that freely share them, even on Facebook forums, oh, you got that written down, and people yeah. share stuff back and forth. Um, because why aren't they following? Not, no, one's keeping, no one's keeping anybody accountable. It's, it's, it's usually. all about adoption and enforcement. Yeah. I mean, how Either often they don't have it, or they do have it and they don't enforce it. Well, well, think think about the most obvious SOP that most shops have, which is a quality control form. How often is that quality control form, control form in the paint department not filled out from the body department? Or it's oh, yeah. just quick quick checks. Yep. Just you know, <coughs> well, that's I'll the stamp it. That's the pencil yeah. whip. So well, a checklist is not an SOP. If, right. if if that's the biggest takeaway we get here, if you have checklists in your shops and yep. you think that that's an SOP. No. <clears throat> well, the so. SOP for a QC form is that when you are in the body department, before it goes to the next department, this has certain things have to be checked. Right. That's an SOP, and we have a checklist for that. Right, and there needs to and be different. accountability, mm -hmm. right? So if it's going to go from body to paint, yep. and the body tech hasn't completed the form, or it's the painter's job to sign off on the body tech so that it passes through, yep. right. if there is something wrong with the body work, it is not the body tech I'm holding accountable. Nope. I'm going to hold that painter accountable or whoever signed off on yeah, it. The, the QC is not a uh, an SOP, but on the SOP listing for processing a vehicle or completing a vehicle repair, SOP might be um, make sure QC form is filled out. Make sure a copy of QC form is in file. Make sure all paperwork is signed by customer. Make sure you uh, um, photocopy check from insurance company. Make sure to walk customer around car. Mm -hmm. Those are SOPs. Yep. That's how I close this file. And the QC list will be on there. What's on the QC list is the list. It has nothing right. to do with the SOP. It just says <coughs> do the QC checklist. Right. right. And, and the SOP would be then to have that, that checklist in the file at the close of the job, etc. But you know the other part of it is is that, and we, we see this like on, on the vehicle check-in SOP, where the customer drops the car off, okay, what do we do? We'll walk around the car as you were talking about. And then on the forms, oftentimes they're gonna have things that they don't fill out, like radio codes. It's on there and they don't do it. So what we are, the subtle unintended thing is that we're actually putting SOPs into things that we don't enforce people doing, and now half the forms blank, why even have the form? Right. Yeah, you know, it's worth doing. And, maybe and a then, general manager needs an SOP that says do have your job. all SOPs <laughs> yeah. been followed. Has the SOP been followed? This department, this department, this department, this department. Are all checklists been filed into the files and presented to you? That might be his check. That might be his right. SOP to yep. go recheck and make sure everyone followed their SOPs. Right. Yep. But if you don't enforce you, it, it's not going to get done. And you got to have them. Even I get asked all the time. Hey, Kristen, we're just a two-person shop or a three-person shop, and do we need SOPs? Yes. You do. E even a lot of times developing them are good for you personally a to eliminate. You're going to forget a lot yep. of stuff. Yep. And you also will be surprised at the amount of waste you mm -hmm. have when mm -hmm. you start doing these. So, yep. Mark, you know, we, when we do this a lot, we go to shops and, and we get, you know, first of all, they're always confused on what an SOP is. So yep. um, the famous exercise, walk us through it. How do we make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Okay. So the first step is we got to open the bread. Wait. What? Where'd the bread come from? Oh, out of the cup, out of the cupboard. Well, how'd it get to the cupboard? Uh, I took it out of the shopping bag. Um, how'd the shopping bag get there? Did you send somebody to go buy it, or did? No, it came out of the car. Did Amazon deliver it? Uh, it wasn't delivered. Okay. So we had to go to the store and buy the bread. And then we had to take the money out of our pocket. Then Where we had to actually. From? How many people had to go to the store? Well, at least one. Okay, so you only you send one person to the store to buy the bread. Well, I don't need two. Well, sometimes you do. Somebody's got to wait. That's true. Okay. <laughs> well, where'd you get the money to, to buy the bread? Well, so I had to get a job for that. A job? Yeah. Wait, Which wait, means wait, I had wait, to read. wait, wait. Someone just didn't come by and just give you okay, money? Okay, guys, listen. Let me just go back till we open the bread. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then we open the bread and we take two pieces out of the bag. Because they're only going to have two pieces. That's the SOP. Okay. And then we're going to put it on the counter. Okay. Now, Larry said we got to put it on a plate, but I'm saying we put it on the counter. What counter? The dirty. counter in my kitchen. Oh, okay, so we're we'll put the counter in. Yeah, yeah. And then I got to <laughs> open the peanut butter, but I had to get it out of the Kay. cabinet. What first. kind of peanut butter? Oh, it's crunchy. Oh, so not the creamy. Not the creamy. So do I need to make sure that I have something that says what specific type of peanut butter? Well, p potentially, yeah. Is a brand required? Maybe. Uh, well, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. And so then I so then I open the peanut butter and I open the jelly. What and kind the jelly, of jelly? Well, are it's they grape. preserves. Are they jelly? Grape? Are it's they grape. Has to be great. It's got to be great in my SOP. 
Now, and then, like is it the squeeze bottle is jelly? It, no, or no, is it bottle, a, no, we're doing the, the, the old school. We got to actually it, open the jar. Is it jelly? And or then jam we got to put a. Or preserves. And then, What's the difference? I don't know. It's got seeds. Can someone Google that? I, I, I'm just wondering. <laughs> Tell okay. Siri, would you? <laughs> so then, the next thing we do is we get a knife out of the drawer. A knife? Then, what yeah, am I getting a knife for? So I can get the peanut butter out of the, out of the uh, peanut butter spoon? jar. Why would you use a knife to get peanut butter out of because a jar? Because it, it sticks to the knife. That's how I do it. Why not but a spoon? Well, because if I use a spoon, then, it, then it's harder to clean, right? How about so, a fork? Well, because I don't want to use a fork. I'm using a knife. It's not going to drip through. Okay. It's not that, you know. I got it. Then we grab, a spoon? and then we scoop the peanut like butter spoon out, spoon. and then we spread it on the bread. How are you spreading it on the bread? Oh, s crossways. Crossways. Now, not the question cross hatching? is, now if you look at the, if you look it's at, it's not going to adhere to the bread. Is it paint the defense? So if you don't cross hatch it, it it's not adhering. <laughs> oh, wax the it's car. It's going to fall off the bread. <laughs> are we going to wet bed this or what? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> is it wax the car or paint the fence? <laughs> so then, so then the other question becomes, and if you look at the the picture that's on the screen. There's four different styles of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So if you tell me to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you can see the results at the end of it are very different depending on how you actually construct it. The last so that's why the, when well you the go bottom one looks like it's a grilled cheese sandwich I with jelly. It actually looks really good. It's, doesn't it though? I can't eat peanut doesn't butter, it? so I'm I I'm thinking know. about like a panini version of a, of a peanut butter and jelly right now. Well, you can do it on the form and grill. Oh. Yeah. So okay, so now we're gonna <laughs> spread. <laughs> so we got to get the peanut butter we out, spread it. Now. We're gonna <laughs> scoop out the jelly and, and uh, spread it on wait, the bread how, with wait. the knife. Wait, you just used the knife for your peanut butter. The, I wiped it off on the now bread. Gonna, it's not part of the oh. SOP, but no, okay, yeah. You're you cross contaminating. Wait, wait, wait. wait <laughs> cross -contam <laughs> would you take the same mixing uh, uh, device, same mixing stick? that you use to mix the paint, would you put that in the clear? What are you, my wife? I'm just trying to come up with something here. I mean, come on, seriously. <laughs> no, who seriously gets jelly out with a knife? I do. How effective is that? I, I mean, it's, it's jelly, it just... Yeah, it just drips off. It, it, it takes, it and takes you only got a little small spot there. Like, I know, you know, uh, 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 you know, I don't eat peanut butter, but I can see peanut butter is a very viscous type material. Jelly's a little <laughs> more... Wait, viscous? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. Go wow. ask Siri, you don't know it. Wow. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, I know big words sometimes. <laughs> and, and But the jelly kind of drips off. Wouldn't you be, I mean, seriously, you'd be better off with a spoon. <laughs> well, and you dig in there, you grab it, away. you slap it on. <laughs> what kind of spoon? Is it longer oh, or shorter? One. Well, as our friend, when we were, you know, because we spend this week preparing for our OE show that's coming up oh, next week. Oh, we had this argument last week, we talk about it. No. It's just, well, I gotta have a long spoon. Well, you gotta, no, it's right? gotta be longer than that, because well, you only get it on your hand. Yeah, but like that. Right. So you can see clearly, I don't have that as part of the SOP, but it should be. So tooling might be a part of my tooling SOP. Tooling might be important. You might actually have to be certified as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich maker. You might have to have a tooling list. Hey, right? I just got a quick question. What? How many times did you get beat with a spoon when you were a kid? Oh, no. <laughs> Up until a point where it broke, then my mother went to Silverstone frying pans. Those broke, and then she became Clint Eastwood with the shoe and would throw it at me. And I learned how to do sheetrock because my mother didn't have a good aim, and the shoe would wind up in the wall, and I had to do sheetrock work. Oh, she's throwing heels at you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. My, mo my mother thought she was uh, Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> and they'd go out and come around like a boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we got it spread on the bread, <laughs> let's get past that. Now we got to pick up the peanut butter. Now the question is, do we pick up the peanut butter side and put it on the jelly, or the jelly side and put it on the peanut butter? Well, obviously you pick up the peanut butter side because no, it no, has the a different No, the jelly's going to run off. The right. jelly's going to so run off. So you pick up off. the peanut butter side and put it on the jelly. Yeah, exactly. And then because unless, of viscosity, unless we put the, the jelly on top of the Viscous. peanut butter Viscous. in the process and cross contamination, as you said, then we got to cut the sandwich in half diagonal. That's how I would do it, and then you put it on the plate and serve. Why didn't I just put it on the plate to begin with instead of now putting it on my countertop and get my countertop? Now, where's my union break this whole thing? That's all I'm wondering there because, <laughs> because now I mean, I've done a lot of work and I'm not getting well, compensated and then, and for it. For my second grade, there was this kid that showed up in second grade and his nanny or somebody made the bread, made the sandwich, and they left the crust on. Do you want to talk about a meltdown at the yeah. lunch table? Because no there brainer. was crust, crust on there. He was crying, and the lunchroom monitor had to come cut the crust off because he was not yeah, but having it. The more important question is, is, is cutting the sandwich diagonally, is that an included or not included operation? Well, you get more sandwich if you do it that way. But, but, it's a, but I, I don't care about that. Is it included <laughs> or not included operation? Wait, what? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Because it's not it's not required. Now is the material the jelly sandwich. in the peanut butter is that an include is that included in the labor time or is that a separate charge we have to do for <laughs> we the material? We would have to call Danny at the DEG. Yeah, let's let's call uh, Danny's not here. Some, someone uh, call Danny, please, and find me. out if it's included or not. So, the, the moral of that, just as simple as making a peanut butter jelly sandwich, is we all make them differently. Mm -hmm. What's standard operating procedure for me for making a sandwich? Apparently, send some people off the rails. Like I would never. I don't think anyone's making a peanut butter and jelly, jelly sandwich jelly. anymore. They're like, this is too much work. Right. <laughs> but this is what happens in your collision repair center mm -hmm. every day. I, as a shop owner, feel like I know exactly how I want the peanut butter yeah. and jelly sandwich yeah. made. And then I've got estimators and receptionists and I've got technicians and porters and detailers and painters and they all want to make their sandwich differently yeah, with Doug different materials. Doug wanted butter too. Doug under wanted butter. butter. Butter on his bread. Butter yeah. under the peanut butter. Yeah. And then what? one person wants grape, one person wants strawberries, yeah. one person wanted bananas on theirs. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Now so, see I would just rather jelly and that's it. Because I can't eat peanut butter. Well, that's not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, then. That would be well, a jelly sandwich. It would be, it's a jelly I want a peanut butter and jelly, jelly sandwich. Hold the peanut butter. Hold the peanut butter, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> kind of like when you want a BLT. Hold the lettuce and tomato, and let's not affect, give so me extra bacon. So the peanut butter would be not included. It would be not included, okay. right. Okay, so yeah. we got that. I can't charge for it, then. But, then, <laughs> but you figure it out somehow. <laughs> Even not including it is a not included. <laughs> so not as included. you guys can all see... This is what we've been debating for the last day and a half. To making a peanut butter and jelly. I swear to God, butter God butter. that's what we've and been what's debating. What's the SLP for that? Right. <laughs> then, then it's and no different. animals were hurt during the process none, of none. making this peanut butter and jelly no. sandwich. No, the monkey was definitely in danger <laughs> yeah. on multiple occasions. <laughs> we've been in the other so, room. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, this is the point of this is what your shop looks like. And yeah. if you don't have a procedure for really everything that goes on in the shop, mm -hmm. well, then you're dealing with chaos. Yep. And if I'm dealing with chaos, I can't measure it, and if I can't measure it, can't I can't charge it, for it. And you can't charge for it. So yep. at the end of the day, we're in this business to make money, and I, I need to know what's happening. No, but, but, but would OSHA allow a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to be made in this shop? I don't know. Well, not, not, not back in the production Wait, OSHA's area. just on safety, so it wouldn't matter. I but, mean, yeah, but the health could, department. Could, could be, well, the health department, then, would they allow a sandwich to be made in the shop? I don't not know. in the back of the shop. Maybe I the don't think so, right? Yeah. So maybe you need an SLP on that. No, SLP, no making. Well, no, I making would need an SLP to review my PPE. Yeah. Right. What's your personal protection why is for making three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Letters. Well, I don't know why it is. It's kind of like it's kind of like every uh, every serial killer has always had three first names. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it's a union thing. All right. So we have established just in the chaos that between the three of us of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Simple as that was. Right. Imagine a shop that had 20 or 30 people in it. We have established yeah. the need for SOPs. Mm -hmm. We will tell you you need them for pretty much everything turning the key in the front door to closing up at night mm -hmm. if that's whatever is in the yeah. life cycle between those two things yep. needs an SOP so how do we do it well first of all and the biggest thing about it is you got to keep it simple you know we, we walk in we see those SOPs and they're you know 15 pages of instructions on how to do a certain thing nobody's read them nobody's following them but darn it we got an SOP for that next thing is you got to start with the end in mind so what's the goal why are we doing what we're doing, what's it got to look like, and then you bring it backwards in how to do it. And the easiest way, as Larry said, was have your employees do it. How do you talk to the customer? How do we do a supplement? How do we, let's just have them write out what exactly do they do and create the SOP. And then what you'll say is, okay, but we want to add this. And then sometimes they'll go, you know what, we don't do that anymore. So take that back out. So we want to update them pretty regular. Mm -hmm. They're going to change Sometimes over time. Sometimes the easiest thing to do, and this is what Chris and I do when we go to um, uh, shops, is we'll sometimes get the people to write down either on a piece of paper or even on post-it notes for different people. So, you know, Kristen Jello and Mark's uh, green and I'm orange, and we'll write down each step for each process that we think. The ones that are duplicate, we throw out. The ones that are different, we'll put on a, on a, on a wall or a mirror. And there's a, these are all hanging up on the mirror. We'll move them around in what order they should be done. Now, these post-it notes help it so you don't have to keep erasing and keep moving stuff. The post-it notes peel off real quick and real easy. Now, I might have a wall with 30 of these on there, but there's my 30 procedures or SOPs for this particular process. So now we know what we're doing. How to greet the, you know, greet the customer. You don't say what the greeting is. That's a separate, you know, form but yep. greet the customer have customer you know get customers driver's license uh, um, information um, assign a estimator um, you know uh, ask the customer if they want coffee you know offer them a beverage um, you know then you go to sign the paperwork 
paperwork's right. a different sheet. So mm -hmm. this is how you create your SLP. So Kristen might have a slightly different take because let's say she's the CSR as Mark might be the estimator and Mark might have a slightly different way of doing the you know, the greeting because he never greets the customer when they first come in. So now Mark will learn the five or six things that Kristen does before he comes involved in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kristen might learn the seven or eight things outside of writing the estimate yep. that Mark has to do for paperwork that he does. So now there's interchangeable there. Yep. I love the post-it notes issue. I actually love these new extreme ones. These are fantastic. Like I've had them on a car out in the weather for mm -hmm. about three months they now and off. they don't fall off. Yeah. It's, it feels a lot <coughs> like the, um, what was that masking tape plus that came out, that yeah. crepeless paper? It feels like it's the masking tape and they put it on a, a post-it note. But here's, here's the thing about post-it notes and the reason why everybody in the shop gets a package to write down on is that it, it, it just is the way of the world. There's always one dominant personality in every facility and everywhere we go. If Larry and I are in the facility, there's two dominant personalities fighting over um, over the air in which <laughs> people like, breathe. Keep the peace. Right. So there's always somebody that will overtake this process. Yep. It's just going to happen. So if everybody's filling out their own, when we get to step one and everyone walks up to the wall and puts up their step one, mm -hmm. if I've got 10 different employees, I have 10 different step ones. Now I want to talk about what the differences between those were yep. and what really is step right. one. So. I may have been at step three and I thought I was at step one, mm -hmm. but we as a group have got to talk about that and go through it until mm -hmm. one thing remains on the board and we're all in agreement. Right. Um, now that I may move my one over here and it may become my three or it may, it may become my negative two yep. or, or yep. wherever we're at, but you definitely want everybody. So I've seen this happen a couple times where everybody gets in a circle and sets around a blank board or a wall in the shop or whatever and says, okay, we're going to do an SOP. And I've got 10 people in the room, I got two people talking. Mm -hmm. So that very becomes something that two people will follow and eight people won't. Right. You get, yeah, you don't have buy-in to the group is the problem. Right. So the post-it notes are great. I've, I've worked with a thousand different ways over the years. I mean, and I remember back in the insurance days, we had SOPs for how we would accept an, a, a claim at an agent's office, mm -hmm. what our processes were for just about everything. And we would have post-it notes all over the room. Um, still the most effective way. Mm -hmm. I, I just well, you can move them. It's just simple. Yep. 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 And stick and they stay forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. and you know, and you can always start with somebody else's SOP, mm -hmm. and everybody look at it and go, yeah, we like that, we don't like that, and and customize it to your shop. Mm -hmm. You know, it, one of the biggest things we see is we walk into shops often and they got their SOPs in a binder up on the wall, given to them by the paint company or something. Nobody's read it, but there's their SOPs. Nobody's right. following it. They feel pretty good about it. And you got, and they got to be visible. People have to understand what they are and referenced. Because as soon as you don't have an SOP on the wall of how we're going to do this, and we're going to talk about how to create one here, then the new employee comes in. If they're not communicated, you have no SOP now. Right. It's gone. And you're done. So let's make one. Okay. Right? Cool. So if we had to, uh, I should have an SOP for everything in the shop, right? Yep. So I should have an SOP for how we wash a car. Sure. Now, right. how many different car washes do I have in the car, in the shop, <clears throat> Larry? <coughs> uh, well, it would depend. I got what my pre-wash before it comes in for estimating. Um, you're going to have your pre-wash before it comes in and stuff like that. And um, <clears throat> so, Do you feel like Larry's the teacher right now? We're just oh, well, well, He no, just no, has no, the no. best handwriting. I know. I um, it. Yeah. So, mine. I mean, look, you, you, have, you should always have a pre-repair, pre-inspection um, car wash. So let's just call it a pre-estimate. Car wash. I mean, you, you have bird droppings that could be on a car, leaves, uh, berries. You know, but New York City is terrible for berries around a lot of the trees. Winter's here. I got uh, uh, grime. Winter, you have yep. grime and, and, and salts that can get on there from, you know, from the snow and stuff. Just regular rain, dirt, water on it. And then, of course, then you have the guy that keeps his car perfect, and it's got armor all and wax and all this other stuff. You don't want none of that stuff in your shop, so you want to make sure the car is clean. There could also be mud and dirt on there because it went off into a, a ditch area in between roadways. So you're going to have all this mud and dirt on there. You need to clean that okay. up, too. So are you saying that we need a different SOP for the winter than we do in the summer because there's berries in the summer and there's none in the winter, so we Once may have again, a different what's, SOP. What's water-soluble, what's chemical-soluble? Yeah. Uh, you also have an issue with, now a completely different issue, is blood. Yeah. Uh, either from an animal or a human being, either mm -hmm. someone got injured in the car or an animal hit the vehicle and there's blood, guts, you know, sometimes feces so and all this stuff. So you got a biohazard all... SOP. Right, right, so you got a biohazard But how SOP. many different washes? So I have a pre-estimate wash, mm -hmm. I have my wash before it goes to paint. Mm -hmm. well, you, but, well, you might have a, a, a primer. You know, pr prior to priming, you have a, a wash. Okay. Three, you might have a refinish or into the booth wash. 
Uh, four, you have technically, you would have a wipe down of the car when you pull it out of the booth, take the paper off, yep. which is a cleaning process, which you would use probably one of the tack rags from inside the booth and blow it off so you got to, um, you know, remove paper. And that's, you know, it's not so much the paper you have to worry about. It's more the little splinters that come off the tape when you pull it back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after that, now you have some argumentative things here. But five Space. might be... Delivery. Well, you have delivery at the end. In between, though, you might have, and we're going to just do this here, you might have um, after buff, just before you glaze, because you don't want that stuff drying on there, mm -hmm. you would have after glaze or to assemble the car. You know, and then you would have your delivery. So you could have either five or you might have seven right. of these car washes. Depends on how <coughs> your shop is. So we started thinking we were going to write an SOP for car wash. So we got to figure out what kind of car wash. But we're we got to now we got to know which car wash am and I I'll doing? And I'll be honest with yeah. you, your two most, your two really big important ones are now. Let's look at this now. There's only there's seven of them. Let's just do five. I have my pre-estimating one. Well, obviously I'm going to have some sort of you know one that re removes wax, grease, everything. Maybe even a degreaser in the engine bay or around the wheel well areas. For my primer area, is that included? no. Okay. Uh, for my primer, I might have only, let's say, a towel wiped out of the mm -hmm. car or a dry one, a dry type of cleaning process. But I still have a cleaning process for refinishing. Well, now you have a problem. What kind of paint do I use? Mm -hmm. Do I use water uh, waterborne paint, or am I using solvent based? Solvent based, I can wash it with water. But if it's uh, uh, waterborne, I can't. I got to wash it with a dry system. Yep. When I remove it out of, the, out of the booth, yeah, the wipe down is going to be the same no matter what paint system you use. But delivery, now here, I have to make sure that I use the right soap, the right type of chemicals and stuff like that. And keep in mind, if I do wash it with water and soap for the refinish, I can't use the same type of stuff that I use for the pre-wash mm -hmm. that's going to have, you know, uh, uh, grease removing and wax removing stuff. So I might have a different, and I can't use the stuff I use for delivery, which might have the soap that has automatic wax coating in it that they mm -hmm. had, because you don't want that going into the spray booth. Right. You know, so you've got to be careful. Yeah. That's why they make colored soaps now oh, at a lot wait, of the it's shops. It's way more complicated than we thought of. Uh, real quick question coming in. Where do I find SOPs for many different procedures throughout the shop? Complicated question yeah. here. There are, the paint companies uh, do have some great SOPs written. Mm -hmm. um, again, they're just a start. You it's a guide. Wanna, yeah, they're a it's guide. It's a guide for you to transfer um, it into your own thing. And uh, then... 3, 3M has a bunch of good stuff right. for their products, right. which is great. Right, and um, you can, there are, there are, if you go on um, 3mcollision.com, there are even pre-written posters that you can print yeah. out. You can download the PDFs and yeah. take them to your own printer or laminate yeah. them. Well, a lot of your paint companies have SOPs that they give you on poster boards, sure. mm -hmm. so you don't have to read the manual for it, but it tells you if you're mixing this type of base coat, clear coat, you use this. If you're using single stage, you use right. this. If you're using uh, with a uh, uh, flattening agent, here's your mixing. They show you on the stick, right. and they show you a big poster, of it, which is like an SOP. But the bottom line is, is that the reason we don't have, you know, everybody always asks me, Kristen, why don't you have a forums thing on Collision Hub where people can just go download them and everything. It's because mm -hmm. what works for me probably isn't going to work for you and your technicians. What yeah. works for Larry works for no one else but Larry. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, but it may not work in a dealership group where things are in different places. It's different for an independent body shop versus an MSO. <laughs> There's so many variables that someone that just comes to you and says, here's a pre-written SOP. Um, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like snake oil in a way. It, it's yeah. really taking your money and your time and wasting well, it. Well, so. so at the end, so we, we've identified a bunch of different washes, but let's just deal with estimate pre-wash. Estimate pre-wash. Okay, so you got to deal with one. So my posted is I I got to go get the car. Where's the car? Well, that's out, obvious. Car's out front. So I'm is it I'm obvious? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I would say, okay, we obviously know we need the car. So that wouldn't be That's technically like an SOP, the bread from the store. but you're getting the who's car to do what? Who's getting the car? Right. Where's right. the car okay. and who's getting the car? Yeah. Right, but who's getting the car and where's the car have to go? So you got to have to go to the wash bay. Mm -hmm. So let's combine the SOP in a way of who we get the car. Who's going to get it? Who so, do we want? Well, do we have a car jockey at our place? Well, do we have a porter? A do porter we not? or whatever. I mean, who do we have? Yeah. Right. Or maybe the estimate is the guy who... You know, talks to the customer, captures the keys, puts the customer in a, 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 a Hertz, rent the car, rent the price, rent the car, and then he's going to take the key, he's going to drive it to the wash bay, and then the porter yeah. takes over. Yeah, I'm not sure, but let's let's come up with a scenario for me. Who who takes the car to the wash bay? I'm a bay? small shop. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't have a porter. Yep. Right? So I drive I it myself. My, 
I want my detail guys staying there detailing cars, so yep. I'm gonna have my estimator drive. So the, the car estimator. Around. Yep. So watch this. Here's your SOP for the shop. Estimator, and I'm not gonna write it all out. Vehicle to wash bay. Yep. And I'll put it here detail department. Maybe the, you know there's a detail department <coughs> that you have. So there you go. Now you just eliminated a couple extra lines by saying the estimator at this shop is going to take the vehicle to the wash bay. Now what happens? Pretty simple. Well, I want my detailer, this would be me, I would want my detailer to sign off that the estimator had completed the pre-check-ins and the things that he needed to do before mm -hmm. it got washed. Yep. So, so is my paperwork this. and everything ready? And that's my departmental checks, that's each department holding each other accountable, yep. that's making sure nothing gets lost. So we're already starting to do QC so before we right write off the, the bat, estimate. The initial QC list, this is how you start it off, yep. estimated check-in. So the detail department will check that the estimator did his job to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. And What's the reason, I just want to let people know, the reason for me that that falls on the estimator, and I know a lot of people put it on the detail tech to do the radio stations and some other things, but there's some conversations with the customer I have to have. For instance, I need to know how many cell phones are paired to that car, who has those cell phones, mom, dad, is it a kid's car? Because when the customer comes back to pick the car up, those things may be they now unpaired. With, with, and if they need help pairing them, because probably when they bought the car, the dealership did it for them, yep, you know? Right. They like don't know my, to, they don't I, know how to do it. I, I, I bought that BMW, I love that car, but I had to go visit the BMW Genius Bar to have them set everything up for me. So if it stops working, I, I either, I have to go back and go you don't re, know how to do reprogram it. Yeah. my car, right? Yeah. So we have to set that up for customers. We can't send them out for that. And I think that's why right. I have the estimator do the pre-check list. For me, it may be different in your shop. You may. Goes out big yard. Yeah, exactly. Okay, All so right. now we're going to wash the car. I think we could possibly get to the point so, where we're actually so ready to initially to wash the car. Now. We're actually ready to turn the water hose so, off. <laughs> well, but, but are we? So now, if we're going to wash the car, this is a pre-wash which might have some degreasers and different things in it, but no wax. Right. So we have to select the soap or the cleaning agent for that vehicle, um, which may be different than the post wash. Right. Okay. And then do we always change out the water for every wash, like you have a fresh bucket of water, or do we have the 55 gallon barrel with the, with the uh, soap in there, we wash every car the same way? You're the premix system, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, if you have that, yeah. Mother's has this that, really though. great detail rack yeah. that premixes. You just put your garden hose to it and sure. flip a switch and it, yeah. Yeah, but they fill up the five gallon bucket and that washes all the cars for the day. Right. Maybe you don't want to do that. It depends on your SOP. Right. Okay. <clears throat> now, yeah, rim and wheel. So I want to make sure that I'm getting the undercarriage blown and, off. And you want to make sure that whatever chemicals you're using, depending on is it a steel wheel, is it a chrome wheel, or is it an aluminum wheel, because you can buy a set of wheels, which I did on a Corvette one time, because we used the wrong acid on the wheels, well, and I had to buy a set. Keep in mind, a lot of times they want you to spray and soap up the car first, mm -hmm. then spray your degreaser stuff so that there's some sort of protection of the soap that's there as you spray it on there, then you spray the undercarriage, the wheel cleaner on there, and then you re-soap everything with the spray or wipe it down or whatever, and you get in there. And that's like, a good point where you might have, I mean, if we think about you gotta it. You got to follow what the, what well, the what people are calling you. SOPs now, what we say are really, they're product use. They're yeah. best yeah. practices for product use. They're not SOPs, but right. it sounds good, so we put them on websites and say download our SOPs. But I may have an SOP, and alongside that in the wash bay, I may have a best practices that says things like that based on the products I'm using and the manufacturer yep. I've selected. So yep. SOPs and best practices can go side by side. Yes. A best practice never replaces an SOP. Right. And nothing replaces the instructions for the actual material. Well, and the and the, so the SOP, if we were to go on the high level, would be we're going to do all the initial paperwork with the customer, then we're going to take it to the wash rack and we're going to do a pre-wash. And then we're going to bring it into our estimating base. So that becomes a higher level SOP with a subset of SOPs. Right. So I've got my, I got my undercarriage, I've degreased, I've soaped. What's next? Okay. Now, now question, are we going to start soaping at the top or at the bottom? Well, we kind of went through this yesterday. Yeah, so I mean, I was always, um, we, we weren't a fancy shop, a little small operation, probably like a lot of people out there. And um, so I did a lot of washing in my younger days. That was my job. It's how pretty much everybody gets their, their start That's in the shop. Start. And for us, it was, it was out behind the shop with a garden hose and a bucket mm -hmm. and, a, and a rag, a mitt rag. 
But I, I always started, and my dad beat into my head at a, at a very young age, to start with the roof, do that top, go glass, come down, do hood and trunk. That way I was always rinsing the dirty soap and the dirty water off the car. Mm -hmm. And that I didn't have to worry about, you know, something drying on the And other then side. how I learned, and my dad's a dentist. Yeah. So he said you always wash from the bottom up. And you would yell at me for getting any water on the top that we hadn't washed yet, because now how do you know where you are in your washing process? So different... Different perspective. Now, yeah. now later on, I learned how to. You got to start at the top for the exact, exactly the reason you said. But not everybody knows that. They right. come into your shop and away they go. And then in your shop, was it undercover, or was it outside we in the sun? We were outside. Well, yeah, we were outside. So you can't wash a car a in the shop. direct sun. Yeah. You know, so that becomes another part of the um, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent against buckets, even with the the little filter thing they put in the buckets now for. Yeah. You know, um, I'm more or less like the what's on the screen there is the spray bottle type of thing with the water. Mm -hmm. It's very controllable. It's not like a pressure jet that flies all over the place. This is pretty controllable, and you can use a rag, mm -hmm. you know, as you do it because it's on the car, and you can rinse off the, the thing every so often. But that dipping the into the bucket thing, putting it back on the car is usually not a good well, idea. And just, all you're doing is just moving dirt from car well, to I'm car. Well, I'm just going to say, as we go forward, we need an SOP for picture selection. Just saying. Um. Uh, <laughs> I got a little fuzzy. <laughs> But, but yeah, how we wash it, the order <laughs> that was we approved wash by it. the editorial board yesterday. Ex well, yeah, but we had been arguing about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> for, for hours, like four hours. <laughs> so, and then we had catfish. So I'm still not figuring out how that happened. For yeah, lunch. catfish, and so. we were talking about peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <clears throat> so as you can see, there's a lot of steps and a lot of things to think about, a lot of conversations mm -hmm. to be having in the shop with everybody involved based on product usage, types of vehicles, what's your operation, who's going to move the car, um, et cetera. And you said it earlier, and I, and, I, and I certainly started out, my first job in a, in a body shop was washing cars. So you normally get somebody that comes in that might know how to wash a car, might not, and we got to train them how do we wash cars or what's our process. This is our way. This yeah. is our way. Yeah. Um, the great thing, I think the best thing about SOPs for me is that when, when you're onboarding a new estimator or a new technician or whatever, you can hand them to them. Of course, they're not going to read them and go, got it, but it's something that they can study, and then now you reinforce it in the shop through what you do and, and yeah. what you um, enforce. You reinforce through enforcement. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, employees appreciate knowing what the rules are. When you come in and say, this is how we do it, and that is the way you do it? Well, you know, I think we're in a day and age right now where the customer appreciates it because God mm -hmm. knows we're, we're screwing up their cars. Yep. So um, if we can't, I always tell the shop, if you can't sit down and figure out how you're going to wash a car, well, you're damn sure aren't going to figure <laughs> out how you're going to roll the frame rail in. Yeah, exactly. So those two things have to go together. So um, Larry's writing our SOP for us, yep. by the way. Yep. <laughs> so, so now when you have the wash mitt, is it wax on or wax off? Wax on. Okay. <laughs> ah, and get that through. But obviously taking care of all of that and getting all that off, I think what a lot of people forget sometimes is, is you know, even though there's a pre-wash, if it comes into body, I'm still going to do a degrease wipe before I start sanding mm -hmm. and doing a whole lot of things just because yep. I don't want to, I don't want to sand into a bunch of contaminants. That's just kind of a waste. Right. Um, well, you'll sand the contaminants into the paint and that's a problem oh yeah. later on. Well, it always cracks me up. I get to a shop, I got a car on the rack and mm -hmm. you can tell they've been banging around on it and yep. I've got mud all under it yep. where it had dried well, and falling. It's all off falling on top of the rack, yeah. Yeah, but they have a dustless sanding system mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> you spend three thousand dollars on a dustless sanding system, but, no pre -wash. but half of the mountain is under the car that they brought in with it, mm -hmm. and dirt and debris and leaves and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to one shop one time, and they were telling us they had a great pre-wash intake, you know, procedure. You know, they they had it all yep. down. And Larry's just staring at him, and they're going through it, and they're telling it, and he's nodding. And I look over, and I see Larry, and he's reached in the car, and he pops the hood, and I'm like, what is he doing? And as soon as he pops the hood, he reaches under and grabs a handful of leaves, leaves. and goes, yeah, your procedure's awesome. Yeah. And he just walks away, and, and I'm it's like, fantastic. well, because when you're painting the hood, that's not going to fly out. Yeah, no, yeah. not at all. Yeah. So, we don't want to bring cars anywhere around wet. I see that a lot. Yeah. Um, if the car drives in... Um, wet and it drips, what now do I have? Have a slip hazard. Slip hazard, yep. Yeah. Slip and fall, so, yep. Um, boom. Yep. So, as simple as something for, we're going to wash the car to do an estimate. Mm -hmm. That could be an SOP for a shop. Okay, so now it's going to Blueprint. Who's taking it to Blueprint? 
Well, I would have to say that more than likely the estimator might have to be called by the detail department because right. you're a small shop yep. and the estimator will come back now and pick up his car and make sure on his QC list that I'm not going to keep writing this stuff, but on his QC list, maybe number 10 estimator picks up car. Number 11, estimator does QC list check in, uh, check uh, detail Off department. The dealer. Yep. And now we go into, we're basically done with maybe 11 or 12 or 13 of these things. And now we go, we'll do a new page and we would go to okay. Blueprint. So let's, let's stop right here. So when I, so before we go to that or whatever, to me, in my mind, when I tell you that SOPs are profit, as I design this out, I'm now getting a good idea of the materials and products I'm using on the car. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a good idea of how many people are involved in a wash, right? Mm -hmm. We've got two people right now involved in washing this car at least. Yep. Yep. Um, we've got multiple products. We've got multiple operations. And so now I know my material and my labor time that yep. I have to account for because we have basically you know, fixed operating costs yep, sure. to buy a shop and everybody, everything in the shop that's not something that I'm going to use for multiple years is part of my operating expenses. Mm -hmm. So now, does $5 for a car wash and point one of labor make sense? No. No. Well, and this is a different car wash than it's the $6 car wash ticket at the gas station. Right. It's a different wash. It's We're going under the wheel wells. We're doing a lot more than just getting the they dirt off the outside. They degrease your car. Right. And as you see, I always call them holidays. The car gets done being washed. You look at it and go, there's all holidays all over the place because they miss washing it yep. at the hand car wash. It's yep. like, what's this? <laughs> you know, go wipe yep. that back off right. again. Then they want to use the spray bottle type of thing and wipe it down. It's like, oh, hang on. Now you're going to rub that dirt into my paint job. No, right. let's not do that. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's just right here I now know, hey, for my pre-wash, I've got a real I a good idea because I know what I'm paying for those materials. Mm -hmm. I know right. approximately by talking to my detailer and everybody how much we're using when we do this. Is it different when I wash a Honda Fit versus when I wash a F-350 pickup truck? It totally is. So, and I'll be honest, a lot of shops don't read the instructions on that. It's not an SOP, the instructions. And you see it's a concentrate you usually get. And you see the tech over there with its five-gallon bucket. And, and it's like this. Boom, 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 boom. And you say... It's like, wait a second, for every five gallon pail, you're supposed to have like, you know, two ounces <laughs> of this symbol. stuff. And you just, you just put, you know, enough soap in there to wash 40 cars and you're wasting my material because right. somebody didn't want to wash, you know. And that's where some of those premix systems comes in handy. That's you a lot easier. You just turn it on and it mixes up. the water and the, and the stuff yeah. right oh, away. Oh yeah, they're great. And I love them. But, and, but this procedure doesn't change necessarily depending on what type of vehicle comes in the shop, but my expenses will mm -hmm. change because yes. of it. So by going through this exercise, I may now have a charge for small pre-wash, mid-size pre-wash, <coughs> SUV, truck. I may have four different pre-wash charges that I mean, now look, you could, you could, I mean, as I said, the estimator comes, picks up the car, does his QC check-in. Estimator now installs steering wheel cover, floor cover, seat cover. I mean, you can go that crazy with who does what job. Mm -hmm. And maybe at the end of the process, like an assembly line, like, you know, uh, Ford originally set up for, you would have Right where the car's sitting, right here when the estimated does his check-in, you know, his check-in list is sitting there. He goes to the QC, checks that. He grabs his tire cover. He grabs his steering wheel cover. He grabs his seat cover. He goes to the car, puts his RO pouch in there that's just starting off, which is kind of empty. And he puts on the seat cover, puts the floor mat, gets in the car and drives it to the blueprint department. That's you know, we might even have a window sticker there that's empty, but he's going to put the window sticker on. And the only thing he's going to do is write the RO number mm -hmm. and his name. Mm -hmm. Now it goes to the blueprint. And now the process continues on, and you write the whole SOP for that. And now I've got a way of basically from the time the tires hit the curve yep. or drop off from the tow truck. This is how we do every it. Every car gets done the same way. Yeah. We're still washing the car, washing and the car. we've been here 20 minutes already. <laughs> yeah. You know, and think about it. We're still washing the car. Yeah. We're here for 20 minutes. We didn't even start doing anything yet for the repair process. Well, and then the other part of this is that when the car comes in, if you just spray a hose on top of it and it really beads up, this thing's covered with wax yeah, or some kind of silicone. Yeah, you don't want that in the shop. A whole other conversation. Hand, you're gonna get. It just becomes a. a it's a mess. You right. know, you really got to degrease that car properly and make mm -hmm. sure it's right because your paint's just gonna come off or your tape's not gonna stick or you know problems with body filler adhesion. Because even though you might sand this area, your hand sometimes is touching here yep. that you don't have a glove on. You just touch wax, and now you just wipe this off to feel and go, all right, that feels good. Now you're going to put your body filler on and literally just start sanding yeah. or rolling right off the it panel. Because yep. right. you just put grease and your bare hand with your well, grease. Or I ate pizza. 
Yeah. There's that too. <laughs> well, but and and even the plastic filler. Sandwich. Yeah, exactly. The, well, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and even the oh, manu- that's a good point. <laughs> and even the manufacturers of uh, of uh, plastic filler, they say wash it with soap and water, wax and grease, and then you put a sander to it. Right, and then you. But you got to do those two things before you apply the filler. And you do those two things yeah. before you ever put a sander and to, to it. And to get a lot that of that reason. wax and grease off. You degrease the vehicle here in the pre-wash, so it helps you out. So you tech it, you know, will really make sure that he's waxing, grease removing any of people's hands that have touched the car or any shop stuff that's gotten on there. Right. Not that the guy's been waxing the car with F11 or any of the other stuff, or it's and forget about it, if it's ceramic coating. That's a completely different process, and you might mm-hmm. have a, a different SOP for ceramic coatings because mm-hmm. you right. got to remove that stuff. So I mean, you know, these are the things that come up, and it makes your shop. You know, this doesn't technically make you more money here, except for telling you what you're spending. But what it does is it makes you more efficient. If you're more yeah. efficient, you eliminate waste. If you eliminate waste, you actually make more money. Well, but it also <laughs> tells your people in your shop, what is it we're going to do every single time so we get the same consistent product, first of all. But as an owner, if I actually really sat down and thought about it, I would be like, I actually spent some money to get that car in just for the estimate. Right. So we get this call all the time. I specifically get it from a lot of the independent adjusters or from the insurance companies. Mm-hmm. Does it really cost that much to pre-wash a car? Does it really? Well, I don't know. We've just sat down here and gone through it. Does it really cost that much? Do I maybe have 9 to $10 in material and maybe have 20 minutes of labor? So $10 pre-wash probably isn't cutting it. Right. Um, now you can decide. But nobody else charges for that. I do, okay. right? I got it. It's one of those things where I don't really not care. Not my problem that I charge Or you may be a shop that says, I get it, and I've recognized it, and I've done it, but I'm still going to stick with the $10 because I'm barely getting that or whatever. Yeah. But I don't, I, I, when, when I do SOPs, they are more than just how I want the car to go through the shop or what mm-hmm. I want that particular department to do. Mm-hmm. They are also a great visual indicator for us to do a couple of things. One, do I have too many damn products in the shop? Yep. So do I need to get control of that? Do I have five different body menus and five different things? And can I make sure that, that I can me, that drives me crazy. drive that down? I don't, I'm not saying the product approved list that comes from a supplier mm-hmm. or, or what are a paint company. I hate it when a paint company comes in and says, this is your shop's pre-approved list. I'll buy what I want. Thanks yeah. for playing. Yeah. But, <laughs> and I'll buy from the OE when I have to buy from the OE. But, but if I've, as the owner, have narrowed it down and say, hey, we're going to use this product and this is what we're going to order because yeah. we know that we're going to get a repeatable process with it every time. But I can now weed out some bad products. I can also see what I'm using and get an idea for how much. And now I can sit back down with my estimators and go, hey, yeah. are we charging appropriately? So when we talk in our estimating class, if you attend one of our estimating classes for profit, we take you through the who process, right? I feel like it's Grinch before Christmas, Cindy Lou Who. <laughs> we take you through the who process. And the way that you do the WHO process is you have SOPs. Yep. So this is how this works. These things have to work together. Here, take a look at this for a second. If I have a, a scratch, let's Are say. Are picture pages? Yeah. Okay. That runs about that long. Oh, a worm. It's a worm. It's a wave. Wave. I'm going to hit you with something. <laughs> it's a clown. Um, <laughs> but let's say this is a scratch on a door panel. You know, because this is a little bit shorter than a door panel. Let's say this is a scratch on a door panel. Just a key scratch. Right. All right? No denting or anything like that. Let's just look right now, and this is why when you do SOPs in each department, an estimator should be sitting there taking notes to see what's going on. And he wants to take notes of what he may not realize what actually goes into the process. So, for example, and let's take your expertise and your years of doing it and just an opinion on this, and I only want sandpaper grits. That's all I want as an SOP here. But I have to sand this down on a door panel. So you start with 80. So I'm going to start with 80? Uh-uh. I'm only going to pay you for a scotch bright half an hour and blend the panel. <laughs> <laughs> What's that over there? <laughs> I'll give you the gray scotch bright just because I'm feeling okay. benevolent so today. We're going to start off with something. So let's say we start off with P80, right? Yep. And we're going to use a little bit of P80. And I feather edge it back and stuff like that. Now what am I going to do after I'm done with the P80? i go to I seem to smooth, smooth it out. Got to go to 180. So we're going to skip... A whole bunch of sin- sanding grits. Or 100 or 120 or 150. Or so let's say an argument, once again, because once most of the manufacturers, especially 3M, or mm-hmm. like we saw in Nissan, because of the feather block and prime yep. process, they yep. don't want you skipping more than one, one grade. sand grit. So let's say we skip, let's go with the P100. We'll skip that, right? Yep. So we're going to go to P120. Yep. After 120, then what do we do? 150. Okay, so P150. Okay. Now 180. 220. 
180. <laughs> Going from 150 to 320. 220? You're going from 80 to 320. <laughs> you're true. True story. <laughs> 320, we might do. Uh, yeah. maybe, and yeah. that's your process of what you're doing there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Now, I prime it, and after I'm done priming, now what I have to do? You gotta, well, you, you prime it, and then you gotta go to 320 and 400. So then you have maybe, uh, uh, some people might do 220. Okay. So let's do 220 here and say we're gonna skip it. We'll go right 320, okay. and then 400. we go 400. Yep. But now we have to prep the rest of the panel for painting. So what's the, what's usually the process? Well, she said uh, Scotch Bright. Yep, Scotch Bright. So, well, um, <laughs> may not, <laughs> they may not allow it, so let's go. Yeah. Let's, Blend yeah. time. Depends on what Scotch Bright it yep. is. I'm not paying full refinish on that panel, Larry. Um, then you have, or maybe you go 600. Yep. Maybe you go a different Scotch Bright pad, or 800. Or Depending the on the paint or the company it's using, another Scotch Bright paste. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And a thousand. Yep. Now. Thanks to Mazda. Arguably. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just combine them. Uh, eight, nine, ten. Ten pieces of sandpaper. Let's just say we just use one piece mm -hmm. for each one. How much sandpaper, how much did it cost for us just to do that? Forget about the labor time. Just think of the materials alone. Right. So feathering out a scratch for an hour and then doing paint time on the door is dumb. Uh, once again, are you charging for your shop but materials? But yeah, exactly. How much is it going to cost you in sandpaper, which is not included in paint materials, it's body materials for taking a scratch out. Right. And look, dumb. we didn't write down the <laughs> SOP of what to do. We didn't write down Disable the SRS. We didn't write down disconnect the battery. We didn't write down mask off any moldings or anything that's going to be a mask adjacent panels for, you know, prevent from sanding. We didn't write down disassemble door or gut the door out or take out the glass. We didn't write down, uh, um, you know, the process of wiping the door down with wax and grease remover. We didn't write down wax and grease remover between certain sandpaper. We didn't write down mask, uh, wipe down a wash car prior to painting. We didn't write down mask off car because we don't have directional primer. We didn't write down, put epoxy coating. We didn't write down a, a primer, surfacer. There's right. a lot of things we didn't write down. We didn't write down a lot. Right, but think about it. You could have a... You and apparently have, we were wrong with Wave. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. But you could write... You said worm. You could write down... A, <laughs> he said Wave and I, I agreed. Yeah. <laughs> you could write down a lot of stuff just for an SOP. Yeah. And I just wanted to prove a point of what an estimator should be doing in these right. SOP meetings, taking separate notes, going... Uh, wait a second, I didn't realize how much sand, or even an owner of a shop, how much sandpaper I'm actually using on right. this. Because that gets reused so frequently in the shop. So, I mean, you got a key scratch this big, right? Yeah. I'm going to go through all those grits. Painters aren't, they're not going to save them, right? So, I mean, I got two seconds of sanding out of a $5 well, sheet. And, of and you also have to understand, if that's a foot and a half long scratch, how much time does it take to do a foot and a half versus a foot? Yeah, there's a lot there. So we had a question coming in. Producers equal procedures, question mark. Um, yeah, I mean, so if I need producers in my shop, if I want them to be producing at max capacity, mm -hmm. um, that encourages my throughput or whatever, they need procedures for that. And SOPs are procedures. Mm -hmm. And once it's all clearly designated, then everyone in the shop, especially if you have a shared role, yep. right? So if I have... Um, um, let's say four body technicians, if they're all doing the same thing, then they should all be producing yep. at the same rate. Yep. Um, no, you never, you never charge an insurance company, you charge the consumer. Yeah, so I think we get confused with that a lot. Do we charge insurance companies? I don't send a single bill and never have in my life as a repairer to an insurance company because the insurance company didn't hire me. The, the customer came to me and said, fix right. my car, yep. right? So do we charge the customer for that? Absolutely. Yes, if it goes it's a on procedure, the, goes on your bill. And it's not included in my estimating system, it goes on my bill. Shop supplies are never included. So those are right. something that we put on the estimate as well. Yeah. Um, and then it's the customers, or we got in this business, I don't know, well, I do know how I got Somehow started. we got in, in the middle. The insurers started it saying, don't put the customer in the middle. Yep. Yep. They don't want to be there. They don't want to get involved in this. They just want to drop their car off and know it gets it fixed. Well, they would like to pick a car up that's fixed correctly, and you can't do it for free, mm -hmm. so the customer was always supposed to be in the middle. That was, yep. that was always how it was supposed to be. Well, that's how they still are, but it's <laughs> right. not identified that way now. Right, you got to get them there. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I left a shop as the insurer, 
And, and you know, you as a shopper, like, I don't want to put the customer in the middle. I don't want to, I'm going to handle this for him. I'm going to turn in the supplement. And what did I do as soon as I got in the car? I called Miss Smith and went, Miss Smith, I'm leaving your body shop. And I don't know. They're just so difficult to deal with. And I don't have this problem with <laughs> anyone else. I put the customer right smack dab square in the middle. Sure. I just got to him before you did. Yep. Um, so, yep, they go there. All yep. right. So, basically, there's a lot of different ways to make SOPs. There's a lot of different SOPs that are out there. Mm -hmm. They make you money. SOPs make you money. Yeah. Because... Uh, but no other reason they let you know what you're spending yeah so when i know what i'm spending either in labor investment or what i'm spending in um uh, material then we can move forward so yep. that's it that's all we've got Pretty for the show, show today um now the hard work begins on doing a whole bat yeah whole thing of sops um yeah so now i got to get to the work right yeah all right, well, if you have any questions about SOPs or anything else that you want to know about creating them or questions in your shop, well, you can always reach us on the website. Absolutely. And we'll see you next month on Repair University Live. Yeah. Thanks.